I always wished I could be a detective, yeah. but I'm very conspicuous, so, so I can't can really make it. You can't see me, Peter. I'm going to cut the gum out of my eyes. If we were born together, why does she look different and I look different? I can't see that you're talking about Camilica. Oh, the issues. They laugh at you. The name callings. Yellow man, yellow man, yellow man. The stairs. I think I also see beauty in albinism. I don't know whether that's true, but I see it and I'm so proud of it. Ah, different. It is simply a skin condition. That's it. So we're here today to talk about Lupita Nyong'o's film, In My Jeans, and uh, the state of uh, Kenyan filmmaking, or filmmaking in Kenya. And um, I um, guess we should start off by asking about the state of filmmaking in Kenya. Um, <laughs> maybe by beginning by telling how you came to make this film mm -hmm. and um, who you worked with in, in Kenya. And okay. Well, I, I began making this film in 2006. It was my final thesis project um, at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. So, yeah, it began as a, as a school project. And I went back home in August of 2006 and um, was there for eight months working on the film and yeah I mean I when I got there I knew I didn't know what I wanted to do I just wanted to make a documentary the subject matter I wasn't sure and how it came to be about albinism was um, with because my friend who is in the film CK um, she lived across from me uh, for 10 years and um, I never knew and I never understood her condition and when I got back my mother had just been to the first Albinism Society of Kenya meeting and she was raving on about everything she learned about albinism and I was shocked and quite embarrassed that I called CK even an acquaintance or a friend and I didn't know about her condition so um, it dawned on me that this could be a very good project for me to work on and for me to learn something and to teach other people as well. What, 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 what kind of insight do you get as a, as a Kenyan filmmaker to, uh, to your subjects that, um, that however skilled a non-Kenyan filmmaker doesn't necessarily have? Well, okay, that was something when I went in that I really, really wanted to achieve. I wanted to achieve honesty and um, just truth. You know, and it was the first documentary film I made, so I had I was nervous throughout. I was a new terrain, and I I, I didn't. I, so I was. I think I was very. <coughs> one person, even CK, said, "Yeah, you seemed a little bit, you know, set, really soft." <laughs> and I think that it's the nature of it being my first documentary, and I wanted to, 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 really. I didn't want the the camera to abuse people. And so it was really important for me to gain the trust of the people I was going to be working with and for it to come from a genuine place. Me being an outsider, I'm nowhere near a person with albinism. And to be aware of that and to go into spaces with, peop of, with people with albinism, not apologizing for not being a person with albinism, but also um, not being presumptuous. But I think also um, in Kenya, and in Africa, a lot of the documentaries are journalistic. And then mm -hmm. when it comes to that, when it's, um, it's got a voiceover and you know, an outsider speaking in on the subject, it's hard to get that intimacy. In this documentary, there's no narration. And I wanted, that was again, an intentional thing. I didn't want to be some sort of lord over the subject. I mean, obviously, it's subjective because I edited it, you know? So my voice is still being heard, but I wanted it to be their story from their mouths. Yes, question. Um, <coughs> what I thought was interesting was was their construction of their identity, that racialization, um, their racialization of being black um, was discussed more than perhaps their ethnic identity. So you have a variety of, of ethnic groups that live in Kenya. Um, and so in terms of feeling a sense of community, I heard them sort of stressing more of 
or grappling with, you know, what does it mean to be black? But I was actually curious, what does it mean to be Kikuyu or what does it mean to be Luo um, or how their ethnic um, communities um, look at them? Do they look at them as not being part of their ethnic identity? I understand about the, the relationship between sort of their colorization, right? Um, but what about this other sort of layering of their, their identity? That's a very good question. And in, I mean, obviously, this is a construction of my editing, right? They definitely did speak about, I, I did ask some questions that didn't make it to the film, about um, their relationship with tribe, their tribe. And uh, some of them commented that people with albinism are lucky, the luckiest group of people in the world because they can stand outside of their, their tribe, you know? As in, especially in Kenya where there's a lot of tribalism, a person with albinism can go unnoticed as whatever tribe because they all look the same. And um, one of the guys, the, the eldest person in my film, Benedict Kinua, he feels very passionate about that strength in people with albinism. The fact that we don't ha they don't have to necessarily ascribe to tribe, you know, and they, they, can, they can be free of that in, when it comes <coughs> to being identified and having to identify with a certain thing. They're, there's, um, they're fortunate in a way to be people with albinism and they can teach other people in Kenya a whole lot about being tribalism free, you know, and what does it mean to be of a certain tribe? What, what does that mean? Just in the same way, what does it mean to be black? You know, we have all these cultures and traditions, yes, but at the end of the day, we're all human and that should be the most important thing. You alluded to this a little bit in the film, but there was a part where one of the girls, I think it was Casey who said... CK. CK. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. other way around. She said something about how I actually kind of get special treatment because I look white. For the most part, they do identify with blackness, but I'm wondering with a black-white divide, how prevalent that is for them to say, well, I, I'm passing as white or you know, and th the fact that they they recognize that they get preferential treatment, you know, in a in an all black society. Was there in your film instances where you felt like Kenyans as black people almost were afraid of their own blackness or, you know, envious of, of albino whiteness? I don't know if that makes any sense or if it's relevant at all. Well, I think, yeah, that's a, a very, my film does not really go in depth um, with the whole uh, black whiteness. Um, I think everywhere in the world there is some sort of envy or, you know, there's still some sort of reverence um, of white skin, unfortunately. Uh, so in Kenya, uh, Kenya is no exception. Uh, we do have white people, but not nearly. Uh, uh, you know, definitely predominantly black, and we have a very large Asian community, Indian community. Um, but there is still that reverence, and it comes from, you know, colonial times where white people got, they had everything, you know, and so, um, with, and white people bring in the money today in tourism. So there's still that reverence of white skin, mm -hmm. meaning success and, and so on. So when these people talk about being treated special, it's like when you go to a restaurant and uh, the waiter comes to serve you first because you're white, you're probably going to leave a bigger tip, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't think... Do you think that anyone in Kenya mistakes a albino Kenyan for a European? Yes, yes, really? oh yes. Definitely, so, I've seen it. I've been. Seen it happen, okay. uh, yeah, and they're referred Where? to. Never be. Yeah, oh. like when I'm hanging out with someone with albinism, you mm -hmm. know, and they're referred to as mzungu oh, as okay. well. Right. That's mzungu is it means uh, white person. It's the term for white person in Swahili, and that's what they're referred to as. So, like you know, they are if they're wearing a hat and they look, they can pass for white. Or, oh, or two Kenyans. I mean, I know a person with albinism when I see one in Kenya, but for the, the untrained eye, you know, someone who doesn't see white people every day and someone mm -hmm. who does not know that al albinism exists, <coughs> they come across as white. In fact, one of the myths or the, the, the ignorant beliefs is that 
uh, people with albinism are born of affairs with white men. So a lot of women get shunned away from their families. Um, be, they get banished because the, the, the man of the house believes that she's been having an affair with a white man. Well, I was, um, uh, and to the filmmaker, what is so beautiful about it, it, you were never intrusive. And what is remarkable is that this is not a picture about disability. And one would think it would be, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. It is larger than that, and I think you said that others uh, have said it's about the human condition. That was what I took away from it, a sense that I was listening to real human beings talking about real feelings and being honest about it. And somehow or another, their disability, because I guess we think of it as a disability, and that's that, that thing brings up a whole other question as to what is ability and what is disability. Yes, and in the film about the point about disability or ability, that's one of the, and, and, and in the part of the film they talk about that, whether they feel that they have a disability or not. And it's very interesting, and it's something that is being <coughs> debated in Kenya now with the Albinism Society of Kenya that has formed and the Albinism Foundation of East Africa, where some of them want to be identified as having a disability and others do not. Because the condition of albinism, what it is, is it's uh, little or no pigment in the skin which affects your vision. Um, you need melanin in your, in your eyes to sieve light. And without that melanin, they have trouble sieving light, and that's why they have astigmatism, and oh. that, uh, and also melanin affects the connection of the eyes to the brain, and so they have astigmatism, and they have trouble seeing <coughs> bright light. So um, in Kenya, they are grouped with the blind or the and the visually impaired, and a lot of them go to special schools um, for the visually impaired, and some of them think that that's great because then they get sheltered from the real world and they can build their confidence and you can see some of them are really confident they're products <laughs> of those schools but then others like CK did not go to a special school and she's just as, as confident and and uh, some of them feel that you know being in a in a in a special school shields you from the real world and could really do you harm when you finally get there and others feel that being in the real world um, you know makes you get the you know the strength you need to fight to fight the stigma and all that mm -hmm. or not and, you know it depends so it's a very interesting conversation to have with, with people with albinism but with uh, everybody with disabilities what is a disability mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i don't have the answer uh, mm -hmm. i think it's a it's a rich it's a rich conversation mm -hmm. uh over this past week um i i was in a bookstore a small bookstore in new jersey and um there was like a guide to little known places in New Jersey. And there used to be an albino village in New Jersey. And you had to go on through a bridge and there was a sign that said albino village, something like that. And I guess it was like people with, um, what do you call it when your limbs fall off? Leprosy. 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 Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. they were isolated like that, you know, living in, in this village. Um, you know, we have this movement <coughs> now that tries to address the, what we used to do, and I still do, I guess, to people who were differently abled. Um, do you see your film as being used in Kenya to, um, to be part of such a movement? You mentioned uh, an organization that your mother um, attended a meeting. Is there um, a movement like that, and will your film and you possibly be part of that? The biggest problem for people with albinism in Kenya right now is, of course, social exclusion and um, the lack of skin protection. They need sunscreen. And so we are working together th with the film to, to create that social awareness and to put people with albinism um, you know, in, in, the, in the forefront, in a good light, you know, and to get people to try and change the mentality because like the best way to get people to change their understanding or their beliefs is to, is to get them to see them in a different light. Uh, especially right now, we, I would like, I would love this film to be, to go around the whole of East Africa because as we've heard in Tanzania and in Burundi and also in Kenya, people with albinism have been killed over the past like 
a year and a half, their body parts are believed to have some sort of magical powers and which the, the witch doctors are asking for body parts to have their clients get rich quick. It's, 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 uh, it's very devastating and it's appalling. So it's really important for me to have this film go around um, East Africa just so that you, people can see that people with albinism are just people like everybody else. One thing that always interests me because I'm a semi-TV film person as well is, you know, one, obviously in Africa we don't have as many resources um, to, to shoot things that would actually <clears throat> make it to the box office here. Um, I guess I'm trying to gauge from you whether African film and filmmaking is making any headway whatsoever in sort of distributing itself internationally. Mm. Wow. Well, first of all, I must say that it's very sad that African film is most seen here and outside of Africa. It's very sad, but it's it's the truth, especially like I didn't know about Usman Senben until I went to my undergraduate program in, uh, at Hampshire College and I had no idea that there was this amazing industry uh, the, all these amazing and like from way back when people Africans making films and I, I was really shocked to, to learn that I could actually take an African cinema class <laughs> what was that and 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 watch all these great great films by all these amazing Jibril Job Mombetti and and Usman Semben and yeah so uh, that's the sad truth but it's also because that's where they get the money to make the films and that's where uh, they make the money back from um, distribution and stuff but that said I do think that the market is growing exponentially in Africa and it was this trend I think was set with Nollywood in Nigeria when Nollywood just cut out all the unnecessaries and got down to just telling stories that people wanted to hear. You know, it's a very mass sort of um, production, but it's what people, and then all the Nigerians gobbled it up and now all of Africa is so hot on, 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 on Nollywood and here you find Nollywood in Harlem and Brooklyn and just about anywhere. You can you can make a low budget film, but as long as you have a good story to tell, and uh, people will watch it, you know, will forgive <laughs> the technical, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the boom mic and yeah, the, the boom, yeah, because if a, a story is com compelling, and I think we can all agree, if the story is compelling, you f you forget anything else. Hollywood in general has made movies about Africans, like. Mm. Uh, I'll give you an example like The Last King of Scotland. Just because I have issues with this myself about how Hollywood Portrays. projects us in film and in television and uh, how you feel about that and uh, if you think that us telling our own stories is, is counter to that and giving a completely different face. I, I read an article by the director uh, and the director of The Last King of Scotland was being interviewed. Um, the interviewer asked him, you know, why is this story told from a white man's perspective? You know, this is a story about an African president. Like, why, why do we have to hear it from this perspective? And what he said was something that I really took to heart and, and I stopped complaining, was that this is the story that I'm going to tell because I'm not an African. Africans need to tell their own story. I wouldn't be able to do it any justice if I told it from their perspective. And I, I was like, yeah, that's true, you know? Like, we cannot blame, uh, we can sit around and complain about how we're being portrayed in film. But at the end of the day, the only people who are gonna change it are the people who care, and that's us. We need to find our own voice. Just be inspired to tell our own stories, uh, because we have so much to tell.